We're reading this morning from Genesis 1, 26 to 28, which starts on page 3. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Live <coughs> over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves along on the ground. And then... Uh, Verse 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And then 3.17-19, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. This ends the reading of God's word. Well, you may feel like, man, we've really camped out on these verses over the past few weeks. And if you feel that way, that's because we have camped out on these verses. <laughs> to do a series on our identity, it's not enough just to talk about what our identity is currently con constituted. Uh, we got to look back first at how it was originally designed. What we were <laughs> meant to look like. And that's why we camped out in the first few chapters of Genesis. Because that's where we see our uncorrupted identity as God designed it, including being made in God's image as male and female, which we looked at over the last two weeks. But in addition to those two truths about our identity, we see the concept of work closely, very closely connected to our original purpose and identity. Now, my first summer job when I was 15 was working at Bethel Youth Camp in Hawks, Michigan, which is about 15 miles outside of Roger City. I was the director's helper and I worked the grounds. My job was to do things like I had to test the chemicals in the pool. I had to get the, the leaf blower and, and, and clean off the putt-putt course there. And I also learned how to drive a stick on a 1950 Ford tractor and I would mow the, the fields. Uh, Bud was my director and I remember that he, he had me work hard but the worst day of work was actually my very first day of work. Back, this would have been after I was in, between my freshman and sophomore year in high school when I was 15. Now, what he wanted me to do is he wanted me to weed whack using this gas-powered weed whacker that he wore like a backpack. Now, back then, if you could believe it, I weighed about 120 pounds wet. Right, Mom? That was, yeah, was pretty skinny. Yeah. And this contraption weighed just about a half a ton, I think. <laughs> right around it, right? So it was like one of those, whoa, don't go too far forward or back and fall over. The area he wanted me to weed whack was about the size of our parking lot. And it was a big area. We couldn't mow it because there, was, there were trees and rocks and stumps. And so he wanted me to weed whack it. And I'm telling you, I thought I was going to die. I couldn't even, I didn't get it done. Like I got like, I'm not sure I got a tenth of it done. And in fact, I can tell you that I have been working a paying job for about 25 plus years now, and by far the most physically intensive day of work I've ever done was that day, and it was the very first day of work I ever did, all right? And I thought to myself, well, if this is what work is, 
and I'm going to be doing it for the rest of my life, it's going to be a very short life that's going to kill me. <laughs> now, I'm sure all of you have a similar story that you can share yourself. Now, perhaps it wasn't actual physical toil. Maybe you worked a job that tested your ability to keep your wits from unraveling. And if you're a teacher, I'm guessing that's probably true. Nicole. <laughs> You know the stress I'm talking about, it would be overwhelming, and it never, work never stay at work. It always come home with you, and you just sit home and cry sometimes, right, Jesse? <laughs> That's right. It's no wonder we might have, not have the highest opinions of work and jobs. For many, they are an unfortunate evil that we have to do because we need money. But... Is that the sort of attitude we should have as Christians toward work? Is work just an unfortunate consequence of living in a fallen world? Well, today I want to share with, give you a biblical perspective on one of the most time-consuming and identity-making parts of our entire lives, and that is our work. <coughs> so let me share with you four biblical principles concerning work. And by the way, while this is oriented towards paying work, like a going to a job, this all everything I'm saying here will apply if you are a stay-at-home mom, if you are retired, um, all of this, because we never really stop working. We just stop getting paid, right? Okay. So, first, setting aside my work experience, work is actually a good thing. And it's part of God's very good design. Let's look at part of today's text in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves <coughs> on the ground. Now, one of the most important things to note about these verses is when they occurred. They were given by God before the fall, before sin was ever part of our world. You see, that tells us that work is not a punishment for sin. Rather, it was and is part of God's very good design for us. And God makes this statement right here when he's creating us. We were created to do work. And initially, this work was to care for God's creation. But what does that entail? Well, God is the owner, and he has made all of us stewards. Stewards of his creation. Nature and humans are not on the same plane. God has placed us over and in charge of his creation. He has given us authority to rule over the animals and to subdue the earth. And this word subdue is actually a military word. And it occurs here in this context, it implies us gaining some control over nature. And to me and many other theologians, this is referred to as the cultural mandate. The cultural mandate does not mean destroying nature. But it means growing in our knowledge of nature so as to harness and control the power of nature. This means developing technologies, advancing science, and building a civilization. A few chapters later in Genesis 4, so here we are in Genesis chapter 1, we're already going to see culture development. We're going to have farming. We're going to have uh, developments in metal. We're going to even have musical instruments show up. Soon, cities and nations are going to begin to form over the next few chapters. And many also note the cultural progress in the Bible, where the Bible begins in a garden in Genesis 1, and ends in a city in Revelation 22, and Revelation, of course, is the last book of the Bible. But, if one only had these verses about ruling and ruling the earth in Genesis 1, you might think, that we are free to use, abuse, and exploit nature how we please. But that is not true. In fact, the very next chapter, chapter 2, we are given more instructions from God that help us to understand better and more fully God's command to rule and subdue. 
Genesis 2.15, we read this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Adam was called to work the garden and also to take care of it. So Adam not only to work the garden, that is to develop and make use of it, but he's also called to take care of it. And in this verse, we have an explicit balance. We are both to rule and subdue nature, while also caring. This principle actually carries into God's law in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, where God gave Moses and Israel like the law, which included practical commands that would help them to care for the land and for the animals. Now additionally, this very good design of God for us to work is not just for this life. Now hold on. This is actually an eternal call. Consider two things. First, we're going to continue to grow and learn and develop in heaven and on the new earth. Heaven is where we will be until God returns and establishes a new heavens and new earth, we're told. And on that new earth, we will do things like learn and grow in, that, in our knowledge. Uh, some people think, well, when we go to heaven, we'll just know everything, right? That God will just zap us with everything we need to know, but that's not true. Only God is omniscient. We'll never know everything like he does. And that is not really even a negative thing. The fact that we don't know everything means we will have the enjoyment of learning and growing over time. Imagine what we will discover, create, and develop after 100 years on the new earth. After 1,000 years on the new earth. So I don't think God is going to just give us instruction manual saying, okay, here's how you can uh, work with dark matter and, and, and harness like time, space, continue. No. Like, as any parent, like, we enjoy watching our children learn and discover and make, make, uh, <laughs> stuff, make discoveries. And secondly, consider this as well. I believe that this gives great meaning to what we do here and now on Earth. In fact, it gives it even greater meaning. Because if the good things in culture, science, technology, the arts, so on, continue into the new Earth, that means what we do here and now really matters. We are furthering not only our present culture and communities, but even into our future eternal home and society. And that's really cool. Thus, part of God's very good design is that we would work to create culture and also to care for creation. But secondly, we work because we are made in God's image. We reflect a God who works, and therefore we work too. At the end of God's creating work in Genesis, we read this in Genesis 2, 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And while God's work in creation is done. God was and is still at work even to this day. What is God doing? Well, first he's sustaining all creation. In Colossians 1, 17, we read that God through Christ sustains everything. It says, He, speaking of Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And Jesus himself says this, says this in Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. God is in control, and in his providence and sovereignty, he keeps the world turning. But in addition, God is at work in our salvation as well. As we said last week, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all have different roles in salvation. The Father planned our salvation, the Son enacted that plan through his life, death, and resurrection, and the Holy Spirit actualized that plan in us and for us. So God is at work both calling people to himself and then helping us become more like Jesus when we do turn to him in repentance and faith. And we see that explicitly stated in this very famous verse in Romans 8, 28, where Paul writes, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Likewise, in Philippians 2, 13, it says, It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. God is still at work. And because we are creating God's image, we reflect God. We are to be like Him. 
we are to work as well. In fact, Jesus' words in John 5, 17 can be our words too. There Jesus said, My Father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And this is true because it was part of God's very good design, and we reflect of God who works as well. However, not everything is peachy when it comes to work, and this leads us to the third biblical principle. Like the rest of creation, our work is fallen and frustrated as well due to sin. This is the one we should all agree on. Yes, our work is fallen and frustrated. Yes. The reality of this is made clear in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, where God declares part of the consequence of sin will be not that we work, because we're always called to work, but it'll be difficulties in our work. Let's read that command again. God said, because you listen to your wife, sometimes I make a joke right here, and I see Adam, you listen to your wife, this is what happens, but there's a conjunction there, because he listened to his wife, and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, not, you must not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Two lines to note. Through painful toil you will eat, and by the sweat of your brows you will eat. And because we are fallen, and our work has been frustrated and made more difficult because of sin, this can show itself in many ways. Uh, <coughs> You see, instead of working with nature, we have to, in a sense, fight against nature to work it and control it. We have to deal with thorns and thistles that can cut and prick us. And some of you work with literal thorns and thistles like I did in my first job at Weewacking. Others deal with thorns and thistles called customers and clients and co-workers and employees and bosses and students. It's important to remember that our work, <coughs> here's the reason why it's important to remember that our work is fallen. Because it keeps us from being overly surprised and upset when things go wrong. And they will go wrong at work. Oh my goodness, I can't believe things went wrong at work. I cannot believe that. I'm having this stress and this anxiety. I can't believe this. No, we should not be surprised at that. Don't be surprised when you don't meet your quotas, when you have conflicts with your coworkers and bosses. It's at those times we need to remember the thorns and thistles God said would be part of our work, the painful toil and the sweat of our brows. <coughs> Let me suggest two other major ways that Scripture emphasizes our fallen concerning our work, or at least our attitudes towards our work. First, sin can cause us to become lazy, and we try to avoid it. We have a number of passages on laziness in the Bible. Let me give you a few. Proverbs 13, 4. A lot in Proverbs, actually. The sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. From our responsive reading this morning, 2 Thessalonians. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Back to Proverbs 24, 20 verse 4. A sluggard does not plow in season, so at harvest time he works. <coughs> but finds nothing. We are called to work despite the difficulties and stress. And if we don't, we shouldn't be surprised that we find ourselves in need. If we are able to work, we should. Paul instructs us in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, <coughs> mind your own business, and to work with your hands. Be productive. Now, the second way sin can manifest itself in our attitude toward work is actually the exact opposite of laziness, and that is, it's overwork. And most likely, as Americans, this is the problem we deal with. It's becoming a workaholic. It's making work the most important thing in your life. It's allowing work to become more important than your family, more important than your relationship with the Lord. And while this can happen to both sexes, this tends to be something that males especially are vulnerable to. Very easy to make work the source for our identity and value. And thus, if we're doing well at work, well, then we can look at ourselves in the mirror. 
But if we're not doing well, if we're failing in some ways, then we feel like I, personally, am a failure. <coughs> Do you know that God knew this would be a temptation for us? And that he had given us something to help us in this battle? It's the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. He tells us we need to rest. We need to chill out. There he tells us to take a full day off each week and literally stop working. <coughs> stop thinking about working. Instead, rest. Enjoy life. Take time to worship. Take time to be with your family. That is how we combat overwork. Now, this temptation to make work an idol is also true for women as well. And it could be associated with careers, but a lot of times it's associated with the work of raising a family. And that, of course, is real work, right? Not real work, right? Thus, often a mom's value is directly associated with how her children are doing. If they're behaving poorly, making wrong choices, displaying an attitude and rebellious spirits, then they feel like they are failures and question their value not just as mom, but as human beings. This is why all of us, male and female, we need to find our identity ultimately in God and not in our work. <laughs> Our work can fail us, and we can fail our work, plunging us into depression if we set our hearts on it. But if our identity is set on God, then even if we fail God, or we fail at work, guess what? God will and does forgive us. Work won't forgive you. And many times you won't forgive yourself even, but God will forgive you. Thus we are called to build our identity on a foundation that can never be shaken, unlike our careers and families. Let me share with you one more biblical principle concerning work that may be the most transformational of all, the most helpful, as you actually go to work tomorrow morning. And it's the fact that we are not called, first and foremost, to work for ourselves to make a buck. Nor are we called to work for others, like our families, to support them. Not even are we called to work for the betterment of our communities and world, first and foremost. As important as those things are. They are not the ultimate motivations, or should not be the ultimate motivations, for our work. We are called, first and foremost, to work for God and His glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Echoing that, in Colossians 3.17, we read this. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And six verses later, he hits it right on the head with this. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for those obnoxious children, for those clients who are so fickle, for that boss who is just is running into the ground, for those co-workers that are holding their end of the bargain, end of the waiting, the, and whatever thing we're doing. No. Whatever you do, work out with all your heart and working for the Lord, not for men. Let me close with some suggestions as to what this actually <coughs> looks like in your work. To work for God rather than to work for yourself or others. Uh, I read an article by Pastor Bob Thune and on this topic. And I'm going to read, uh, share with you a part of that article to close our time today. I thought it was really spot on. He writes this. When you show up at your job, you're there for the glory of God. God wants to be honored in what you do and in how you do it. Well, what are some ways that God can be glorified in our work? We'll consider these biblical ideas. God is glorified when we put our whole selves into our work with a view toward pleasing God, not men. God is glorified when we are honest, even when it hurts us or prevents us from getting ahead. God is glorified when we honor our superiors and submit to their authority. God is glorified when we treat our work associates with kindness and respect. God is glorified when we expose fraud and dishon or dishonesty or unethical behavior. God is glorified when we approach our work prayerfully. God is glorified when we avoid complaining or grumbling, even in less than ideal work situations. God is glorified when we refuse to make work 
and money are idols. God is glorified when we plan diligently for the future. God is glorified when we live simply and give generously. God is glorified when we trust Him to provide today <coughs> what we need for today. And God is glorified when we rest from work. In all these ways and many more, we can do our work to the glory of God. And he finishes by saying, so go to work tomorrow, or next month, or next year, and do your absolute best. Be the best employee, the best manager, the best associate you can be. Seek to be known as the most honest, most humble, most ethical, most competent person in your field. And do all this not to advance your career, but to honor God's name. Amen? Amen. Next week, we're actually going to be taking a quick break. I am one of the five couples, part of the five couples that are going to the couples retreat. Next Sunday, our own Mike Bennett has a message for us on the life of the prophet Samuel, taken from 1 Samuel. He actually did this. He's been itching to do this. He gave this to me back in like the early spring or summer. And I said, Mike, this is great. I'll be gone in October. I'm going to set you up here. So uh, I know Mike's really excited about that. So come and hear Mike next week. And in two weeks, our next uh, topic on the Denny series will be the fact that God created us with freedom. Freedom of the will to seek him or to not seek him. Let's close our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the work that you called us to do. Father, I pray that these biblical principles will help change how we view our work, be it paid work, be it domestic work, be it volunteer work, whatever you have us to do. May we do it for your glory, doing it for you, not for men. Father, we thank you so much. And we ask that you would strengthen us in these convictions. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.